By the late 80s, it was clear that video games were a growth market. After surviving the crash of 1983, the industry was once again mining gold with powerful home consoles like the Nintendo Entertainment System and its mascot Mario. Still, even after all that, there was a definite sense that the medium was only at the tipping point before spilling over into true mainstream success. There was still plenty of room left to grow. For one thing, all games were two-dimensional, but products like Sublogic's Flight Simulator showed that real-time 3D graphics were possible and an obvious area for expansion. For another, the personal computer was taking off as a must-have item for every household, yet nobody was seriously trying to turn it into a gaming platform. The situation was ripe with opportunity, if only someone with the vision and ability to move the medium forward could burst onto the scene. And then in the early 90s, out of nowhere, they arrived. They were a couple of 20-somethings with no money and no corporate backing. Just a couple of dudes who shared a house and decided to make some games. Only a few short years later, they had single-handedly changed the entire industry, electrified the emerging internet phenomenon, and rewrote the book on selling software. They were the new gods of gaming, the doom of side-scrollers everywhere, and still just 20-somethings with no corporate backing. They were id Software. And they did it because of a letter from a liar. At the time, a company called Softdisk created business and utility applications every month and sent them out to their subscriber base. It was a nice little business, but to really kick it into high gear, they wanted to get into gaming. To that end, they created a sub-label, Gamer's Edge, and staffed it with a small, young, but passionate team. The team had a John, a Carmack, and a John Carmack. John Romero both built the software tools and designed the games. Adrian Carmack was a talented young artist with a taste for the twisted. And the unrelated John Carmack was a programmer with an untapped brilliance that was about to explode. Romero had convinced his boss that PCs were the wave of gaming's future. The Apple II and even the Macintosh had come and gone. And now, it was the Microsoft DOS that was going to take over. He successfully argued that if he and his team could produce quality games for DOS PCs, they would make a killing. But even though their boss agreed, there was a problem. PCs of that era weren't very fast. The Nintendo Entertainment System had gorgeous graphics, vibrant colors, and smooth animations because it was a powerful, dedicated gaming device. Generalized PCs didn't have the same power, and thus, couldn't play games as good. Games like Mario had proven that scrolling was a major seller. The screen wouldn't remain static as the character moved around. The character would effectively stay at the center of the action as the entire world moved along with him. The side-scroller genre was exclusive to consoles because only they had the silicon muscle to constantly redraw the screen at a fast rate. PCs just couldn't do it. And because they couldn't, they would forever be consigned to being a secondary gaming platform, a lesser entity than the mighty NES. In the meantime, however, there was another guy who believed in the power of PCs, and also in the power of modems to link computers around the world, a technology called the Internet. Scott Miller was making so much money distributing his games on this Internet that he had quit his day job. He had single-handedly developed a model in which he would put a portion of the game online for free. Anybody could download it onto their PC and play it. But at the end of this trial, there would be a screen telling them that to play the rest of the game, they'd have to mail in a check. The system completely cut out retailers, publishers, marketers, and traditional inventory problems. All he needed were great games to distribute through his company, Apogee. One day, he played Pyramids of Egypt and loved it. He could tell that the guy who had made it was talented and was exactly the kind of game he was looking to distribute. The programmer was John Romero. But when Miller learned that Romero worked for Softdisk, he was dismayed. Software companies were notoriously paranoid and would often read a programmer's fan mail to make sure nobody was trying to headhunt him for their own business. So, to get around the censors, Miller sent in a letter pretending to be a fan. Then he sent another. And another. 
always pretending to be a different person, but always leaving the same callback number and address. Romero was flattered, but never bothered to call back. Then one day, while reading a PC Games article on none other than Scott Miller, he noticed his address at the bottom. He'd seen that address before, somewhere. He looked over at his wall, where he'd pinned his fan mail, and there was the address again. On all three letters, Romero was outraged. What was going on? The letters weren't from real fans, but from some weird guy. He sent back an angry letter telling Miller exactly what he thought about being lied to. But for whatever reason, he also left a callback number. Miller immediately called him back, apologized, and offered him a deal. If Romero would make games for him, he'd give Romero a huge percentage of the profits. And all of a sudden, Romero wasn't mad anymore. He had a way out of soft disk. Meanwhile, John Carmack had changed the world. Without telling anyone, Carmack had been wrestling with the issue of side-scrolling on a PC for a couple of nights. Plenty of other veteran, high-paid programmers in the lucrative industry had struggled with the same problem and given up. Carmack, though, realized the real issue was right in front of their face. The computer wasn't fast enough to redraw the entire screen every frame. So why redraw the entire screen? If the sky was always the same shade of blue, and it was already on the screen, why redraw it? Why not just redraw the parts that actually moved and changed? Then instead of thinking about it, he just did it. Late one night, only he and his friend Tom Hall were still at work. He showed off his neat little trick to Hall, who thought it was awesome. So awesome, in fact, that they should remake the first level of Super Mario Bros. 3. So they stayed up all night, did exactly that, then put it on a disc that they left on Romero's desk. When Romero came in the next day, he found the disc and loaded it up. He got a strange title screen. Dangerous Dave in copyright infringement. This was weird. Dangerous Dave had been a character in a game Romero had made before working for Softdisk. Curious, he started the game. Yes, there was Dangerous Dave, in a level that looked a lot like Mario. Then he hit the arrow key, and the screen scrolled. Carmack had been proud of his achievement. Hall had thought it was cool. Romero was blown away. Side-scrolling was the holy grail of gaming. It was what kept consoles as the dominant gaming platform over the much larger PC market. Whoever could harness side-scrolling on PCs would control the universe. And now, they harnessed it. Romero immediately convinced the guys that they had to drop everything and use this power as much as humanly possible. More than that, they needed to keep it secret from soft disks so that they could start their own company and use Carmack's incredible technology for themselves. And so, for the next few weekends, they made Super Mario Bros. 3. Not a look-alike, not a rip-off, Super Mario Bros. 3. On the PC. A pixel-by-pixel -pixel translation done by hand using Carmack's tech. To do it, they borrowed their work computers from Softdisk every weekend and then brought them back early Monday morning before anyone noticed they were missing. When they were done, they excitedly sent their work off to Nintendo. They said that the PC market was the wave of the future, and if Nintendo wanted to cash in on this market, all they had to do was sell the very conversion they'd just done, and pay them for the work they'd done. Astoundingly, Nintendo declined. Mario was half the reason people bought an NES in addition to the PC they already owned. Nintendo wanted to keep it that way. The guys were crushed. But then Romero remembered Scott Miller from Apogee. Why remake Nintendo's games when they could make their own games and sell them through a man dying to work with them? Romero called Miller back and told him that they could make him a game that he could sell through the internet. A game that could be cut up into a free trial and a full paid version. And best of all, it could scroll. A scrolling game for PCs. Was he interested? Of course, he was. Once again, borrowing their work computers at night, the guys created Commander Keen. A fun, light-hearted adventure about an eight-year-old boy and his overactive imagination, it was both an addictive game and a staggering technical achievement. The design prowess of Tom Hall, the tools created by John Romero, the artwork of Adrian Carmack, and the engineering genius of John Carmack all combined into a title the likes of which no one had seen before on PCs. 
Scott Miller released the free trial to the internet on December 14, 1990. Up until that time, his entire business had been making around $7,000 a month. Only 10 days after release, Commander Keen alone had made $30,000. The guys with no investment money, no backing from a big corporation, and no reputation had conquered the software world. Their game, which had never seen a store shelf, had made them an astounding amount of money. And in 1990, the internet hadn't even made it to most households yet. A fake fan letter from Scott Miller had put them on the edge of something exploding, and they knew it. On February 1st, 1991, John Romero, John Carmack, and Adrian Carmack left SoftDisk to go it alone. Tom Hall would join a few months later after he'd finished his responsibilities at SoftDisk. All they needed was a name. Before, they'd been calling themselves Ideas from the Deep, but the name was too long. They decided to just shorten it. The first two letters were the same as the part of the brain that Freud had dubbed the hedonistic pleasure-seeking side. And it was also an acronym for In Demand. It was settled. They were id. Tune in next time to watch id create the next dimension. As the 80s turned into the 90s, the holy grail of the video game world was side-scrolling. Smash hits like Mario had proven that players wanted to feel like they could explore a single, massive environment seamlessly. But at the time, PCs were trying to become affordable for every household, which meant that many weren't putting in the most expensive hardware. Only dedicated gaming consoles like the Nintendo Entertainment System had enough horsepower to run a side-scrolling game. PCs had to make do with individual rooms. But one day, a gifted young programmer named John Carmack figured out a trick that could get smooth scrolling onto average computers. At the same time, his co-worker John Romero had gotten an offer from publisher Apogee to distribute games over an emerging technology called the Internet. Combining their talents with their friends Adrian Carmack and Tom Hall, they created Commander Keen, a side-scrolling adventure game. Apogee released a free trial of the game over the internet, and then offered to send players the rest of the game for a fee. It made $30,000 in 10 days. An absolute phenomenon and a system shock to the computer gaming crowd. The guys quit their jobs at SoftDisk and started their own company, which they called id Software. They had already changed what was possible on a PC. They were about to transform an entire industry forever. The guys at id had their work cut out for them because they weren't quite free of soft disk yet. Carmack had created his tech on soft disk's time and they had made Commander Keen on soft disk's computers. But then they had sold the game to Apogee, and SoftDisk never saw a dime. To keep from getting sued by their old company, id agreed to develop a game for them every two months at a rate of $5,000 per game. But they wanted to be making their own games as well, and the dudes of id had a new inspiration. Wing Commander had released the previous year, taking the 3D mechanics popularized by Flight Simulator and adding a combat element into it. The result was a revelation to the guys, a three-dimensional vehicle shooter from the first-person perspective. Technically, this was nothing new. Battlezone had released all the way back in 1980 with the same basic mechanics. But Wing Commander had updated and modernized the idea and made it look good. The problem was that it was slow. High-resolution graphics in three dimensions in real time was a huge burden on the processors of the time. But id's resident programming genius, John Carmack, thought he could do better. In April 1991, id made Hover Tank 3D for SoftDisk to distribute. 
It was a 3D vehicle shooter in which a pilot had to navigate his tank through a maze to rescue citizens while fighting off mutant monsters. Gameplay-wise, it wasn't a revolution over anything Wing Commander had done. Technically, however, it was light years ahead. Carmack's engine avoided the slow jerkiness of earlier 3D games and presented the player with a smooth, fast world. While an important milestone for the company, proving that the guys could handle 3D game design, it didn't leave a big impact on the industry. As a soft disk product, it was only available to their subscriber base, and thus couldn't spread by word of mouth the way id's internet-distributed Keen Games did. Knowing that, and knowing that Commander Keen Games could make them much more money than $5,000 a pop, the guys decided to revisit the side-scrolling world, once again with updated tech from Carmack. At the same time, they wanted a change of scenery. The guys had grown tired of Louisiana, most of them had only moved there to work at Soft Disk. Tom Hall, in particular, longed for his native Wisconsin, and convinced the guys to move up to Madison. In September 1991, id Software invaded and set up residence in its employees' new apartments. While working on the next Commander Keen games, they also needed to get a new game out to Soft Disk. Switching states hadn't ended their obligations. Hover Tank 3D had been cool, and they wanted to work more with this new dimension while keeping Keen with its side-scrolling roots. As such, November's soft disk game was another first-person game, this time without any vehicles involved. Instead, in Catacomb 3D, the player would be a powerful wizard blasting monsters away with his spells. Graphically, it was another leap forward, with decorated walls and more characters on screen at once. And without id knowing it, the game was also the snowball that started the avalanche. By taking the vehicle out of the equation, Catacomb truly brought the player into an immersive experience. By showing the wizard's own hand from a first-person perspective, it made the player feel like it was actually him casting those spells. Wing Commander had shown a hand as well, but in that case it reinforced the idea that the player was protected by a powerful starship. In Catacomb, the player only had himself. It made him feel both vulnerable and empowered at the same time. It was a tiny, little difference, but it was all the difference in the world. When Scott Miller at Apogee, the company that distributed id's non-soft disk games through the internet, saw Catacomb, he was blown away. He loved it, and he asked if the guys could make a game like that for him. Id tackled the problem after finishing up with the new Keen game. What should they do? Carmack was already rolling on yet another upgrade to his already groundbreaking game engine. But they needed an idea to fuel that engine with. Then programmer John Romero hit on a gold mine. What if they did something like Castle Wolfenstein? Castle Wolfenstein was a 1981 PC game in which a prisoner of war in a Nazi fortress breaks out of a cell and shoots down or sneaks by guards on his way to freedom. It had been a great game at the time. Now that id was armed with Carmack's tech, maybe it was time to bring the idea back. To their surprise and delight, they quickly discovered that the company that owned the rights to Castle Wolfenstein, Muse Software, had gone bust and taken the copyright to its grave. The Wolfenstein IP was now public domain. Anybody could use it without having to pay a royalty. It was settled. Wolfenstein 3D was incoming. The guys were excited about the project, especially Romero, who was soon bursting with ideas. Very quickly, it was apparent that Romero, who up until then had been a programmer, was taking over design duties. In theory, that was supposed to be Tom Hall's job. As it happened, Hall was the one guy who didn't like the Wolfenstein idea. To him, games should be fun, friendly affairs. Commander Keen had been his baby. Now the guys wanted to be shooting down German guards and attack dogs, and what was more, they wanted to do it with tons of blood. Game violence at the time was relatively cartoonish and tame. All of a sudden, Hall found that his co-workers wanted to introduce gore into the medium. He was starting to feel like maybe this wasn't what he'd signed on for. For Romero, it was the opposite. He was concocting a brew of fast-paced action, intense combat, gorgeous art, and gleeful gore. It was harder, edgier, and more brutal than anything else on the market. A heavy metal assault on a world of pop. What was more, they would be distributing the game through Apogee over the internet, which meant that this game could grow by word of mouth in a way Hover Tank and Catacomb never could. There was a sense that they were charting unexplored territory, inventing the rules as they went along. There had been plenty of shooters before, 
but always in the safety of a vehicle. Like Catacomb before it, this game would strip away all barriers between the player and his enemy to make an experience that pit the player himself, all alone, against the German army. Apogee released Wolfenstein 3D to the internet on May 5th, 1992. Nothing was ever the same again. Commander Keen was an incredibly successful game. With basically no inventory and no retailers to pay thanks to its internet approach, the game was bringing in somewhere between ten dollars to $30,000 a month. Wolfenstein brought in $200,000 a month for a year and a half. The gaming world had absolutely exploded around the game. There was nothing like it. Nothing had that same sense of speed and intensity. Nothing looked that good and ran that smoothly. Nothing else dared to show blood. Even the almighty Nintendo Entertainment System had nothing even remotely as immersive as Wolfenstein. A handful of guys in Madison, Wisconsin had electrified the world without ever shipping a copy to physical stores. It was a revolution. And it made the guys the hottest company in the industry. A traditional publisher, FormGen, asked them to make a Wolfenstein that would be sold in stores. The result was Spear of Destiny, which released in September of 1992. Nintendo itself, which had spurned the guys earlier when they tried to sell them a PC port of Mario, now begged them to make a console version of Wolfenstein. But without any blood, and with giant rats replacing the dogs. Shooting dogs in a video game was much too violent. Shooting actual people? That was A-OK. -okay. The game even managed to prompt one of the earliest debates on the legal status of the internet. The game had been made by Americans, sold by other Americans, and had never been on a German store shelf. Nevertheless, legions of German kids were playing it. Unfortunately, any representation of the swastika is illegal under German law. Had id Software somehow broken the law? And if so, how? It was one of the first warning signs of the internet phenomenon to come, and its place in a suddenly small world. In the meantime, the game was formally banned in Germany, which didn't stop anyone from downloading it. And if all that wasn't enough, other developers then started asking if they could license Carmack's incredible engine. Now they weren't just selling the game, they were selling the code that powered the game. The money was flooding in, the guys were suddenly rock stars, and id Software was firmly established. But already Romero and the id team were looking towards the future. Clearly, 3D shooters from a first-person perspective, the so-called first-person shooter genre, were taking off. 2D and side-scrolling, the tools that had gotten it off the ground in the first place, were ancient history. There was a sea of change happening, a shift towards immersive environments and high-octane action. It had begun the wave, and now they were going to ride it for all it was worth. They knew the new game would be a shooter. They just needed to figure out what tone and setting to go for. Whatever it would be, Carmack already had a name, one he thought would encapsulate everything that their next masterpiece would represent to other games on the market. In 1986, the classic film The Hustler had finally received a sequel called The Color of Money. In it, billiards hustler Tom Cruise brings in a black case containing his favorite stick. When someone asks him what's in it, he replies, Doom. Tune in next time to watch id conquer the world. By 1992, 3D shooter video games from a first-person perspective were nothing new. All the way back in 1974, two games called Maze War and Spaceum created the genre. Over the years, commercially sold products like Battlezone and Wing Commander emerged that brought the genre forward. These games were from big-name developers and publishers like Atari and Origin. But on May 5th of 92, a game released that would blow them all away, reinventing the genre on the spot. 
It didn't come from a big name developer. It came from a couple of kids making video games in their apartment and calling themselves id Software. It didn't sit on store shelves in nicely made boxes. Rather, a portion of it was downloaded by kids with modems for free, and then the rest would be mailed to the gamer directly if he paid a fee. It was Wolfenstein 3D, and it was a revelation. Slicker, faster, and prettier than anything else on the market, Wolfenstein showcased both the design prowess of John Romero and the engineering genius of John Carmack. The combination of non-stop action and visual feast was unbeatable. The game was a towering success, and id immediately wanted to move on to the next project. They didn't exactly know what it would be yet, but thanks to a line from Tom Cruise in The Color of Money, they already knew that the name would be Doom. Just before the release of Wolfenstein, the id crew decided it was high time to move again. They just survived their first winter in Wisconsin, barely. Meanwhile, Scott Miller over at their publisher Apogee was encouraging the guys to move closer to him in Dallas, Texas. Since Texas also happened to be much closer to the sun, id and the guys moved to Mesquita on April 1st, 1992. After the Texas move, id wanted to make a follow-up to their smash success in Wolfenstein, and also a brand new game showcasing the brand new engine that Carmack was hard at work building. They still only had a handful of people, and they all wanted to be working on the new game with the new engine. They decided to hand Wolfenstein 2 off to Apogee, which also had an internal development team. Apogee put a lot of great work into the project, but id would later backtrack on their own idea and cancel the project. Rather than let it all go to waste, Apogee retooled the game and released it as an original IP called Rise of the Triad. As for the id crew, the first thing they needed to do was settle on an idea. Wolfenstein had been a blast because of its action and visuals, but also because of its cool pulp Nazi theme. They needed something equally cool, but totally different and fresh. They actually tossed around the idea of doing a game based on the 1986 film Aliens, but they knew they'd have to relinquish creative control to 20th Century Fox. Rather than argue with a movie studio, why not do their own thing? Carmack offered demons as a cool subject. Most of the guys had played a long-running Dungeons & Dragons campaign together in which demons had figured prominently. They'd enjoyed fighting demons then, and the guys agreed the gamers probably would too. Better, what if they combine the awesome sci-fi tech from the Aliens movie with demonic monsters from hell? That could be a killer combination. The id crew loved the idea. Adrian Carmack, the young artist who had found an id, along with the other Carmack, Romero, and Tom Hall, was ecstatic. He loved drawing the sick and twisted, but so far id had only done kitty games like Commander Keen or realistic games like Wolfenstein. A demonic game would let him finally go wild. The one guy who wasn't happy was Hall. Hall had been the mastermind behind Keen, which matched his preference for lighthearted games. Wolfenstein had been too brutal and bloody for his tastes. He'd been expecting id to go back to making Keen after the Nazi affair, but to his horror found that instead id would be ratcheting up the mature content to the next level. As the guys got to work designing their new experience, Carmack was, yet again, crafting a groundbreaking masterpiece in his new engine. Still just 21 years old, Carmack wanted the new Doom engine to make the Wolfenstein tech look primitive. Instead of having one flat surface, he wanted to have multi-leveled rooms and stairways. Instead of being trapped indoors all day, he wanted to go out into open spaces. He wanted to have dynamic lighting. He wanted to have odd angles and weird geometry and he wanted it all to run smoothly on the hardware an average gamer might have. In short, he once again wanted to do the impossible. And while Doom would represent a leap forward for engine technology, it would also be a leap for its business. Apogee distributed a portion of their games as free shareware online, and then mailed the full game as physical discs to gamers who paid a fee. Under a very generous contract, a large portion of the revenue was split with id. While immensely profitable, Apogee was now falling victim to its own success. Orders for the full version of the game were processed over the phone by one or two guys. That worked fine when Apogee was small. Now Wolfenstein had made them huge, 
but it was still one or two guys hand processing every order. It wanted them to contract with a phone order processing company, but Miller was slow to change. By now, the id crew had seen everything they'd needed to. They were intimately familiar with the shareware distribution model, which required no overhead and no investment. It was time for them to implement it themselves. They could go fully independent, self-distribute their own game, and keep all the revenue for themselves. The guys were ready to strike out on their own. For the game itself, they pulled out all the stops. Romero crafted levels that not only perfectly showcased Carmack's tech, but also took the Wolfenstein formula to the next dimension. Adrian Carmack and new artist Kevin Cloud went for that extra layer of realism by crafting their monsters out of clay with the help of professional modeler Gregor Punchatz. The results were then scanned into the computer for a look that no other game could match. Adrian Carmack could finally unleash his taste for the bizarre, and his enthusiasm shined through his work. But for all that, the good spirits weren't contagious. Tom Hall was still not happy on the project. He would never like the violent direction, but he had at least tried to come up with a compelling character and story. But Romero and the others rejected his narrative, stating that it would only get in the way of a pure action experience. Doom only needed to establish a cool setting. Any actual dialogue or characterization would just water down the result. With no passion for the project, Hall's work output suffered. Tom Hall had founded id with the other guys. He had been the very first to realize the potential of Carmack's side-scrolling engine, and he had helped make Dangerous Dave in copyright infringement. Commander Keen, id's first success, had been his idea. But the company was no longer the same. It had grown up without him, and now it had outgrown him. Based on his lackluster output for Doom, he was asked to leave the company. He was stunned. But after some hesitation, he realized that it was the best thing for everybody. If it was going to make games like Doom, then it was time for him to get going. Not for the last time, one of the founding voices of id Software quit out. As the game neared completion, they sent out early builds of the game to playtesters. Not long afterwards, an alpha version of the game leaked onto the internet. It wasn't exactly a good thing, since these gamers' first impression would be of an unfinished code. But it did help to drive the game's hype to a fever pitch. It was already an underground phenomenon, since legions of Wolfenstein fans couldn't wait for id's next project. Now it was on everyone's mind. Even the leaked alpha game was amazing. The finished version would have to be a masterpiece. At last, on December 10, 1993, id uploaded the free trial version of the game onto a server at the University of Wisconsin. As soon as it went up, the server crashed. It had been overloaded with download requests. It was midnight. The University of Wisconsin had never seen, never fathomed that kind of traffic before, and certainly not in the middle of the night. Doom had arrived. Wolfenstein had put the rest of the gaming world to shame. Doom had made it look like a kid's toy. Only one year younger, Carmack's Doom engine looked a generation beyond the Wolfenstein tech. Filling out the engine's power was the outrageous art design of Adrian Carmack and Kevin Cloud. Romero's level designs and enemy encounters were a masterclass in pacing, tension, and unrestrained adrenaline. It was everything that Wolfenstein had been, but it was better. And there was one other, minor, little addition. Multiplayer. Up to four players could play on a local network, or two players could go head-to-head -head over the internet. Romero had coined this game style as Deathmatch. It became an industry buzzword, as the multiplayer component soon overtook the campaign as the biggest reason to buy the game. Commercially, critically, and historically, the impact of Doom cannot be overstated. Wolfenstein had been a mammoth, runaway hit by selling roughly 200,000 copies. By 1995, it was estimated that Doom was on 10. 
million computers. The exact number is hard to track since the game had a free downloadable component, but any way you slice it, that is an absolute win. Bill Gates himself was jealous as his company Microsoft had just spent millions of dollars advertising Windows 95 in return for less traction than a couple of guys in Mesquite, Texas got off of reputation alone. The result was a Windows 95 event showcasing the operating system as a games platform, which included a video with Gates himself in Doom's World. These games are getting really realistic. Next year I might even play in the uh, big Doom tournament. You might wonder what I'm doing here. The richest man on earth put himself in a video game to help sell the biggest product of the biggest tech company in history. That was Doom. And if all that wasn't enough, Carmack had also specifically made Doom to be modder friendly. Modders were programmers who would take a game and change or modify the code to do something else. This was normally a fairly difficult hack. Doom made it easy and accessible, allowing all kinds of coders to show off their creativity in any number of ways. It was just one more reason to buy the game. In fact, it was a value addition even for non-coders, since they could still benefit from all the new levels and modes being unleashed by the modder community. It was like buying one game and then getting tons of new content for free every week. It wasn't a product, it was a service. And of course, half the industry wanted to license Carmack's tech. For a fee, they could. The end result was a roar of money the likes of which had rarely been seen. To give some perspective, a modern game with a multi-million dollar advertising campaign across all gaming platforms is considered a success if it sells several million units. Doom did that just by word of mouth at a time when the gaming market was much smaller at a time when the internet was only in its nascent stages. Doom is frequently cited as the most influential and important video game in the history of the medium. For years after its release, other first-person shooters, and there were a lot of them afterwards, were referred to as Doom clones. It's been called the most ported game of all time. The id crew weren't rock stars anymore. They were legends and millionaires to boot. Romero and Carmack became famous for their sweet Ferraris. Carmack, being the perfectionist he was, even dared to mod the supercar into even better performance. But Carmack could always be counted on to keep a level head. Romero went off the rails, fully embracing his new superstar status to live it up with parties, cars, and his own custom-built mansion. His lifestyle wouldn't be a problem, so long as he kept up his work ethic. Romero was sure that he would. The other guys were not. Tune in next time to see Id split apart. By the end of 1993, the developers of id Software had become the new face of American entrepreneurship. After creating a great game called Commander Keen in their spare time, they published it through another small company, Apogee. Making use of the emerging internet phenomenon to skip retail stores completely, Apogee turned a number of id's games into solid hits. But Wolfenstein 3D in 1992 overwhelmed Apogee by becoming a runaway success a fast-paced action title that invented the modern first-person shooter genre. With that kind of profit under their belt and having learned everything they needed to from Apogee, id decided to go it alone for their next game. They would self-publish the project, a shooter that would be similar to Wolfenstein but better in every way. Convinced that it would conquer the world, they chose to call it what it represented to other developers. Doom. Even with their own insanely high expectations, 
Doom's success blew them away. It became one of the most popular and influential titles in the medium's history, a reputation it retains to this day. The 20-somethings of the company were now millionaires and the kings of their industry. But as they moved on to their next masterpieces, the fault lines within the company would shake them to their core and once again split the founders apart. After the release and subsequent domination of Doom, different members of the id crew focused on different projects. For engine coder John Carmack, the next step was to craft an even greater machine. For as good as it looked, the Doom engine was technically not 3D, but rather a very good approximation of it. The players still couldn't look up or down, and the enemies were still represented by 2D sprites. True 3D was clearly going to be the future of the medium. Carmack's engines had redefined what was possible on a PC, and he wasn't about to stop now. But creating a new engine would take quite a while, and in the meantime, its designers still had his excellent Doom tech to work with. The success of Doom had obviously attracted the attention of major traditional publishers. It inked a deal with GT Interactive to create a boxed Doom game for store shelves. The result was Doom 2 Hell on Earth in October 1994. Using the original game's tech, John Romero and the design team crafted new missions and maps for the player to blast his way through in single and multiplayer. The game was another huge seller and gave the company a strong retail presence. Combined with boxed releases of the original Doom for PCs as well as consoles, and it was beginning to see the advantages of the traditional route. With the windfall profits that Doom had earned, it began staffing up into a bigger company. With more employees working on their new games, Romero felt like he could start working less. It was a fair point. In crunch mode for Doom, he'd basically been working around the clock. Now he could work a normal eight-hour day. Problem was, he spent most of those eight hours playing Doom online. Outside of work, he was living it up with big parties and fan events. Nominally, these were improving id's relationship with its audience, but the rest of the guys were getting nervous that he just didn't care about actually working on the games anymore. Romero was starting to look like a loose cannon. After completing Doom 2, they needed to figure out what they wanted to do on their next game. The Wolfenstein-Doom combo had been a success for its innovations in both technology and design, and Romero felt like their next game should mirror that philosophy. So as Carmack and his team perfected the new engine, Romero once again concocted a brand new gameplay formula. Where Doom had been all about guns and distance, the new game would be a first-person melee game that got players up close and personal with the enemy. The idea all stemmed from a major character in the Dungeons & Dragons campaign that the guys had played for years. In that campaign, a powerful warrior named Quake helped the guys defeat monsters with his powerful hammer. And so, both Carmack and Romero wanted to make Quake the star of his own game. The problem was, until Carmack and his team got finished with the code, it was all just on paper. It was impossible to actually test Romero's new melee combat design to see if it played as well as he thought. And Carmack found that the jump from pseudo 3D to actual 3D was bigger than he had first thought. Promised release dates for Quake slipped by, and in the meantime, the design team was twiddling their thumbs waiting for the engine to finish. Adrian Carmack and his art team were turning out great concept art for the medieval fantasy game, but like the designers, couldn't implement any of it until Carmack was done. Eventually, a meeting was called to discuss the future of the project. Carmack was still working on his engine. If they waited for that to finish, and only then got started on the hard work of building, testing, and refining a brand new game style, the project could be delayed for years. Some of the guys believed that it would be a better idea to just make another Doom-like shooter, or even Doom 3. Romero hated this idea. He didn't want id to be a company that just made the same game over and over again. He wanted to innovate with each new franchise. To his horror, he found that everyone else, including Carmack, disagreed. They wanted the game to be done in a timely fashion, which meant jettisoning either Carmack's tech or Romero's design. Romero lost. They'd be making a first-person shooter.
With a familiar direction to follow, the team found it was easy to craft the game once Carmack and his team finally finished the code. The results of their efforts were once again extraordinary. The engine could render true 3D environments smoothly and beautifully, allowing the player to look in any direction he wanted. Aside from the graphics, the engine was also a leap forward in networking. Doom had allowed two players to go head-to-head -head over the internet. Quake would allow up to 16 players to play simultaneously. If any game could make Doom's multiplayer look quaint, Quake could. With the engine done and the designers and artists finally able to work, one thing that remained was the sound design. It had never handled sound internally, always contracting out somebody else. This time, the rock stars at id employed a real rock star to create a sonic masterpiece. Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails had been a huge fan of Doom and was only too happy to write all the music and design all the audio for Quake. It would sound as amazing as it looked. As if all that wasn't enough, when it finally came time to release the game on June 22, 1996, id decided to merge the lessons they'd learned from online distribution with the power of retail. When Quake hit store shelves as a boxed product, gamers found that it only cost $10. However, only a portion of the game was playable. To unlock the rest, they'd have to pay id another $50 to get an unlock key. It was an innovative idea, but there was one factor that id hadn't counted on the widespread piracy afforded by the internet. Once one hacker figured out how to unlock the full game for free, he posted the hack online, and before long, everyone was doing it. The same technology that had spread id's games to the far corners of the earth was now eating into their profit margin. Even for all that, Quake was another huge success. As anticipated, the 16-person multiplayer made for an infectious addiction that spread from one friend to the next. Entire offices would stay late after work to deathmatch against each other. The phenomenon became so big that a couple of local fans in Dallas decided to host an open deathmatching event. Anybody could come, all you had to do was bring your own computer. The result was QuakeCon, and to the fans' delight, the id team themselves showed up to hang out. The event has since become an annual affair, a showcase for sweet hardware rigs, and an announcement venue for id's newest projects. Aside from the sales of the game itself, Carmack's engine was again the talk of the town, and the licensing fees were a huge source of revenue. Notably, the Quake engine would power the first game of Valve software, Half-Life, and would be the base of their future source engine. Of the many things accomplished with the Quake technology, one of the more surprising was the first piece of film created in real time with a 3D renderer. Diary of a Camper was a quick little joke put together by a group of Quake players called the Rangers. In it, the Rangers must defeat an opponent who isn't playing fair, and when they finally kill him, find that it was John Romero himself. This use of a game engine to create film was later termed machinima. The medium is still going strong to this day. Everything was going great. The game was selling well, and people around the world were playing online. But back at id, a storm was brewing. Carmack had had enough of Romero. Carmack felt like his co-founder just wasn't invested in the actual work anymore, just the fame and glory. At the same time, Romero was feeling like id was becoming stagnant, just making one shooter after another instead of innovating new ideas. Finally, the inevitable arrived. Carmack, with the rest of the company behind him, asked Romero to resign. As with Tom Hall before him, Romero found that the company he had helped create had turned into something else. He felt that id was now just a tech company that didn't care about the design anymore. Thus, he agreed to resign. He had plans anyway. He and Hall had reconnected recently and they wanted to start their own company, where design would be king and the tech would serve them. It was called Ion Storm. With only two of id's four founders remaining, the developer got to work on Quake 2. 
After the failure of their $10 model, id realized that the industry had changed and they needed a top-level publisher to help them sell their product. So they signed a long-lasting deal with Activision, which put out the Quake sequel on December 9, 1997. The game was a hit, but at the same time proved Romero's suspicions. While boasting yet another engine masterpiece from Carmack, the actual gameplay was little changed from its predecessor. Some reviews faulted the company for just spinning its wheels, albeit with shinier wheels than before. Meanwhile, other shooters like Jedi Knight and Goldeneye were pushing the envelope with exciting stories and more features. As id got to work on Quake 3, the internal problems were only getting worse. Romero, for all his wild antics, had also been incredibly personable and a good team leader. Carmack, by contrast, was a reclusive genius who didn't know how to keep a crew motivated. Worse, Carmack started making decisions that he refused to back down from. As they began work on the new Quake, Carmack announced that the game would be multiplayer only. No story, no campaign, no monsters. Just pure, unadulterated deathmatch. The crew was furious. They'd been making futuristic shooters for years and they wanted to finally try something new. They wanted to create an exciting new world to explore with cool monsters to fight. Carmack ignored them. Quake 3 Arena released on December 5th, 1999. As Carmack wanted, it was an online-only futuristic shooter with, you guessed it, his team's latest masterpiece of an engine. Of all their many engines, this one would be his most successful in terms of licensing. A huge number of games from across the industry would make use of it. Notably, the young upstart Infinity Ward would use it to power the first Call of Duty game, and the engine powering the current series derives from it. But that being said, both the engine and the game itself found themselves in unexpectedly stiff competition with another shooter called Unreal Tournament. Unreal Tournament had released just a week earlier, and while it also was a multiplayer-only shooter, it featured a smorgasbord of different gameplay modes. Quake 3 was all deathmatch, all the time. Nothing else. On the tech side, Unreal's creator, Epic Games, released a suite of editing tools with their game that made it easy for anybody to create content, even non-coders. In the coming years, Unreal's engines would overshadow its. It was the last month of the last year of the 1990s. Throughout that decade, from Commander Keen to Wolfenstein 3D to Doom to Quake, the guys at id Software had redefined what video games and gifted video gamers were capable of. In many ways, it had been their decade. But during the course of the next decade, id would release exactly one game. Tune in next time to see id transform itself all over again. By the end of the 1990s, id Software was on top of the world. From its humble origins as four guys who had just quit their job, to the creation of legends Wolfenstein and Doom, id had popularized both 3D graphics and first-person shooters. From there, they went on to create Deathmatch and Online Multiplayer, features taken to their peak with the Quake series. The original game was quickly followed by a sequel, which in turn was followed by the multiplayer-only Quake 3 Arena in 1999. Including the various games they made in the early days, that made for over a dozen titles in id's first decade of life. But for various reasons, the first 10 years of the 21st century would find the legends of id setting their sights a little smaller. After 
the departure of id's co-founder john romero in 1996 the company effectively came under the control of programmer john carmack Though other employees like CEO Todd Hollinshead and creative director Tim Willits still had a lot of sway and were even given co-ownership of the company, Carmack was now the captain of the id boat. As the lead programmer, Carmack's primary interest was in crafting ever better engines to power id's games. Meanwhile, as company leader, he was interested in keeping the crew small and focused. These two philosophies, when combined, created an unintended consequence it made game making a very slow process. In the early 90s, a handful of guys had crafted Doom. Ten years later, that simply wasn't possible anymore. If Carmack wanted id's next game to utilize his next engine, which he did, and he wanted to keep the engine team small, which he did, then it was going to take quite a while for a new title to materialize. And it did. Id officially announced to an excited fan base that a new Doom would be coming. It was the franchise that had defined first-person shooters, but there hadn't been a new Doom since 1994. And from the announcement in June 2000, it would turn out to be another four years before the game was done. So in the meantime, id decided to leverage its powerful intellectual properties. In November of 2001, Activision published Return to Castle Wolfenstein from developers Grey Matter Studios and Nerve Software. Grey Matter's single-player campaign was considered a fun, if average, romp through pulp Nazi fiction, but the real meat of the package was Nerve's multiplayer. Though there had never been a multiplayer Wolfenstein before, it was this feature that made it stand out from the crowd. The title sold well enough for Activision to commission an expansion pack. However, when they tested the result, they found that the single-player was even worse than before. So bad, in fact, that they deemed it unsellable. However, once again, the multiplayer was pretty good. So Activision decided to release the multiplayer component as a free download called Return to Castle Wolfenstein Enemy Territory in May 2003. That's right, free. It didn't even require the original game to work. Anyone could download and play a great Wolfenstein multiplayer game for free. Why on earth Activision would do this, nobody knows. But gamers weren't complaining. The Wolfenstein games were good, but they lacked that magic level of id polish. What fans really wanted was Doom 3. However, because Carmack insisted on keeping the company small, the crew couldn't finish a polished AAA game with a great engine until 2004. This was five years after the release of Quake 3, the longest wait between id games in the studio's history. To no one's surprise, when it finally did release on August 3, 2004, the game looked amazing. While the newest id tech was great all the way around, it had a special emphasis on lighting. This allowed the team to turn Doom, one of the greatest action games in history, into more of a survival horror feel. Rooms would be dark and poorly lit, and the player's little flashlight never revealed enough for the player to feel safe. Combined with the depressing but stunning art direction, not to mention a masterful use of sound, and the result was an experience that could chill hardened gamers to the bone. Toxins. However, the astounding presentation was not matched by the gameplay. Doom 3 was a remake of the original game, and it showed through in its design. Enemy types, AI, and encounters were all considered pretty basic, and most reviewers noted that it felt like a 1990s game. The player would walk into a room and blast monsters that walked straight towards him. Of course, since the room was so dark and the player could hear the monster breathing down his neck, the dread generally made up for the design. The multiplayer was also pretty bare bones, making for a game that truly felt like the original Doom repainted with the best engine around. But it was more than enough to get fans excited, and was the first exposure of many younger gamers to id's software. Doom 3 went on to become the most commercially successful game in id's history. No small feat. Interestingly, these revenues were split evenly between the PC and Xbox versions, proving to the company that multi-platform development was the way of the future. That being said, its huge sales were at least partially because the gaming market in 2004 was much larger than it was in 1993. Even with the good numbers, Doom 3 did not change the industry the way its predecessor had. Strangely enough, despite its clear strengths, the new engine did not license out very far, only going to projects associated with id. 
By this point, the Unreal Engine had established itself as the go-to technology of choice. After Doom, id once again began working on a new project. But Carmack still wanted to keep the company small, and he wanted the new game to use yet another engine. That tech would be years away from completion. In other words, after the five-year wait for Doom 3, it looked like the next title would take even longer. And with development costs for AAA games rising across the industry, that was going to be a big problem. But Carmack was nothing if not independent, and he wanted his company to be too. That didn't stop rumors of an acquisition from surfacing. Since the release of Quake 2, it had had a publishing contract with Activision. Now, word had it that the industry giant wanted to buy Little Id outright. Right around the same time, artist and co-founder Adrian Carmack left the company. He later sued Id, claiming that he had been fired before the Activision merger in order to keep him from getting any of the money that would come from it. The lawsuit was eventually dropped, probably because Id never sold to Activision and thus rendered the suit moot. Nevertheless, of the four voices whose chorus had created Id, only one now remained. As with the Doom 3 wait, Id decided to license out its properties to other developers in order to keep the revenue stream flowing. Quake 4 from Raven Software, Enemy Territory Quake Wars from Splash Damage, and Wolfenstein from Raven again would all release in the following years. These would all use Doom 3's engine and look good, but as with that title, they all felt outdated. It was as if Id had been such a monster success in the 90s, neither they nor the companies who worked for them could bear to change that style. One day while he was on vacation with his wife Anna Kang, Carmack messed around with some mobile games on her phone. He determined that there were no good games for the small screen. So he started doing some research into mobile graphics technology and the state of the mobile gaming industry, and put together a plan on what he and Id could do to improve it. While still on vacation. So once again, Id began licensing out its properties. Their first mobile title was Doom RPG from Fountainhead Entertainment, which just so happened to be Carmack's wife's company. The title sold well, and the following year, Fountainhead created Orcs and Elves for Id, their first new IP since Quake in 1996. Id continued to release new mobile games in the following years, and since the release of the iPhone, have begun working in that market as well, with titles like Wolfenstein RPG and Doom Resurrection. In February 2009, while still working on their new project with no end in sight, Id decided to re-release a classic in a different guise. They put up a beta for Quake Live, a free download of Quake 3 Arena with a few changes. It was an experiment in a new revenue model. The game would be paid for entirely by in-game advertising. Sadly, this didn't pan out quite the way Id hoped, so they later switched to a subscription model. A player can still play for free if he wants, but he'll get more maps, modes, and servers if he pays. This new version was successful enough for Quake Live to come out of beta in August 2010 as a full product. In mid-2009, id received something that they'd received many times over the years, an offer for acquisition. Id had always turned these offers down. Id prided itself on its independent spirit and its ability to do whatever it wanted without interference. Additionally, Carmack liked having a small, tight crew, as opposed to being one part of a much larger machine. But with this offer, id actually began to discuss it. As much as they loved being on their own, it just wasn't sustainable anymore. They hadn't released a game of their own since 2004, and they were still years away from completing their next game. In other words, after their prolific output of the 1990s, all they had for the 2000s was Doom 3. They'd spent millions in development already, and would spend millions more. Worse, given the sheer amount of time the new game was taking, they realized that it would be better to grow the company to have two teams making games simultaneously. To do that, they were going to need some more capital. So on June 24th, 2009, id shocked the world by announcing that they would become a subsidiary of ZeniMax Media. ZeniMax had been famous for years as the parent company of RPG powerhouse Bethesda. In the late 2000s, they'd started up their own publishing label. With 2008's Fallout 3, they had proven that they could take a 10-year-old franchise and make it a mega-hit. With Bethesda, they had proved that they let their talented crews do what they did best without getting in the way. And since they were still a small publisher, they'd be sure to throw their weight behind every single game in their arsenal. It had decided that they were the perfect fit to take their company into the next decade. 
As a full member of the ZeniMax family, id now has two teams working on games full-time. One team is currently at work on Rage, a new IP that will blend elements of driving, RPG, and of course, shooting. Set in a post-apocalyptic world where gangs are the only law, it looks to be a bloody good time in a very id future. It will be the first game to use id Tech 5, the latest engine from Carmack and his team. From the previews shown, the engine looks to be very good. Whether or not it can redefine the possible like id's early tech remains to be seen. Meanwhile, id has already released Rage for the iOS. The title is one of the first truly hardcore games for mobile phones, and along with its gorgeous graphics, might push that format away from its casual roots. The other team is hard at work on a brand new Doom game, though what exactly it will be is unknown. It is known that it will also use id Tech 5, so they don't have to wait another 10 years for the next engine. Going forward, it is likely to produce a number of id Tech 5 games across PCs, consoles, and phones, while Carmack and his team refine id Tech 5 and eventually get started on id Tech 6. Id Tech 5 will now only be used by ZeniMax or studios publishing through ZeniMax, ending Id's long history of open engine licensing. With the new owner taking over the business side of things, Carmack can once again concentrate full time on the code. However, he has started another company, Armadillo Aerospace, where he is the lead engineer designing rockets to fly into outer space. Whether or not he will start to concentrate more on rockets than rocket launchers, only time will tell. Regardless of where id goes with its future, there is no denying the incredible legacy that the company has already made. From 3D games to first-person shooters to online networking, id has defined the direction of modern gaming and many of its current conventions can trace their origins to Wolfenstein, Doom, and Quake. The success story of the 20-something dudes has inspired generations of new game makers, and by the same token, the splitting of the company's founders stands as a cautionary tale to them as well. With only one game released in the last decade, id does not tower over its competition the way it did back in the 90s, when everything they did blew the world away. Some would say it is impossible for them to ever reclaim that reputation. But if id has proven anything, it's that the impossible is what they're best at.